After more than 70 years of development, Red China's economy seems to be maturing. However, many indications suggest that the ascension from bottom to top in social class has virtually come to a halt. On the path to the upper echelons of society, children from the rich and politically connected elite families have a clear advantage, and children of poor or rural families have less and diminishing access. Scholars from the National University of Singapore and the Chinese University of Hong Kong published a paper in February 2021 entitled, China's Rising Intergenerational Income Persistence. The paper singles out the post-1970s, i.e. those born between 1970 and 1980, and the post-1980s, i.e. those born between 1981 and 1989. What these two groups have in common is that their parents belong to the bottom 20% of the Chinese economic pyramid. The percentage of the post-1970s who have risen to the top 20% is 9.8%. The percentage of the post-1980s is 7.3%. In other words, the total number of post-80s from poor families moving to the top is millions less than the post-70s. Other data shows that children from the most disadvantaged families in China are less likely to rise to the top 20%. On the other hand, the phenomena of class solidification is becoming more and more serious. The percentage of children whose parents are in the top 20% of income earners who remain in the top income group is about 45.9% for the post-1970s it rises to 48.7% for the post-1980s. It suggests that the offspring of the wealthy are increasingly likely to maintain the same economic status as their parents. And due to China's long-standing strict household registration system for the vast majority of children from poor or rural families, passing the college entrance exam and going to university is the only way to break out of the rural class. In 1977, China reinstated the college entrance examination system, which has since been described as a thousand horses crossing a single wooden bridge. The slogan, knowledge changes destiny, has spread throughout China since. For students, it seems that the better the university, the better the job opportunities, and thus, the more opportunities to enter the upper echelons of society. <laughs> Parallel to the entrance exam system, in the late 1970s, the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, began market-oriented economic reforms to avoid bankrupting the country. A group of wealthy people emerged from many ordinary families as a result. However, it has changed quietly as China's economy grows. The report mentioned previously says that from 1980 to 2016, China's real GDP per capita increased nearly 20 times. However, during the same period, the Gini coefficient rose from 0.31 to 0.47. The Gini coefficient captures the broad picture of inequality, namely that income inequality in China is worsening. In 1978, the top 10% of China's income group constituted one quarter of the country's total income. The bottom 50% of the income group similarly accounted for another one quarter of the country's total income. By 2018, according to the World Bank, the top 10% of China's income earners account for more than 40% of the country's total income, and the bottom 50% of earners have a combined income of less than 15% of the country's total income. In 2020, the top 1% of China's richest individuals own about 30% of the country's wealth, an increase of 10% from 2000. It means that the richest 1% of individuals in China have amassed more and more wealth in the past 10 years. According to the Who Run report, there were more than $1,000 billion Chinese entrepreneurs in 2020, a number that is bigger than the combined number of billionaires in the US, India, and Germany. Chinese Premier Li Keqiang has publicly admitted that more than 600 million people in China earn an average monthly income of less than 140 USD, and they account for about 40% of the country's population. $140 is 40 less than the average monthly expenditure in rural China in 2020. China is a country. 平均水平是三万元人民币，但是有六亿人每个月的收入。
也就是一千元，一千元，在一个中等城市可能租房都困难。现在又碰到疫情。The market economy practiced in Red China is in essence the capitalism of the rich and powerful. The public resources of the state and society are transformed into assets which are gradually divided and monopolized by the rich and powerful class of the CCP. The associated benefits flow to individuals who are well connected with the governments at every level. Many CCP government officials have themselves become entrepreneurs. The red elites are forever privileged. They grow up attending distinct kindergartens and schools and living in distinct compounds. If private entrepreneurs aren't connected to the political power in China, it's difficult for them to gain any real edge in the market. The selection system of officials in a country or regime plays a vital role in social stability and development. In ancient Chinese society, the fairest system of selecting officials, in comparison, the imperial examination system was born, which is a system for selecting officials through examinations. It's generally believed that it was first created in the Sui Dynasty and established in the Tang Dynasty. The imperial examinations were held once a year, and from time to time, special examinations were held by the emperor to select officials. During the Tang Dynasty, there was no restriction on age or wealth, and in principle, all men were allowed to apply for the imperial examinations, except for a few people with specific status, such as criminals and merchants. The imperial examination system lasted for more than 1,300 years and had significant impact on the political, economic, educational, and cultural beliefs and social customs of ancient Chinese society. An ancient Chinese poem reads: "One is a scholar in a field house in the morning, but ascends to the court of the emperor in the evening." This is the most graphic description of the ancient Chinese imperial examination system. The top scorer in the imperial examination was called Zhuang Yuan or champion. Nowadays, Chinese people refer to the top scorers in each city or region in China's college entrance examinations as champions. In a 2017 interview with the media, the champion of the Beijing college entrance examination, a student who hasn't yet entered society, was asked if he believed that knowledge could change his fate. He replied. The college entrance examination is a class examination, and it's getting harder and harder for students to get out of rural areas. I was born in Beijing, and the educational resources I could enjoy in the big city, like Beijing, determined that I could take a lot of shortcuts in my studies. I can see that many top students in other cities now are people with good family fortunes and connections. So having knowledge doesn't necessarily change fate, but not having knowledge will fail to change fate. This story resonated with many Chinese. One online commenter wrote, "All roads lead to Rome, but someone lives in Rome." It received 100,000 likes. As early as 2013, according to a study in China done by scholars at Tsinghua University and Stanford University, it was found that students from poor and rural areas in China who took the college entrance exam were 11 times and 43 times less likely to attend the top 100 universities and leading universities, respectively, than urban students. The study showed that in 1990, about 22% of the students attending Tsinghua University, one of China's top universities, were from rural China. But by 2016, the percentage dropped to 10.2%. One Chinese scholar conducted a field survey in 2011 and concluded that family status was directly proportional to the type of schools attended, stating that the lower the social class one comes from, the worse the school one goes to. Chinese families also vary greatly in their investment in education by class. According to AXA Investment Management, the average household in some first-tier cities already spends a quarter of their actual salary on tutoring their children, 
rural students don't have such opportunities from their families. In August, the Xi Jinping government banned the out-of-school training industry in what appears to be an attempt to promote Commonwealth and help ease the burden on parents. China Newsweek reported that some teachers have changed their status and become nannies. The real identity of these nannies is that they live in the homes of their employers as tutors. Some earn as much as 3,000 to 8,000 U.S. dollars a month. In an interview, one live -in tutor described the circle of people he knew. The husband runs three businesses in foreign trade, and the wife manages the books. He has hired two nannies to take care of his two daughters. One is responsible for daily life, and the other is responsible for learning. The one who is responsible for learning is a senior graduate of an Ivy League university in the U.S. and speaks six languages. The businessman said, When you have a business as we do now, time becomes a very scarce thing. You have very little time to spend with your family. Having a meal at home may result in a few million dollars less business. In the face of such a situation, everyone chooses to give up family time. It can't be helped. On a popular website in China, an article was written about this topic. Can poor families raise rich children? The author is an HR professional at a Chinese commercial bank who received a group of interns. The article described how the children from the most privileged family could easily get a job in the bank without doing anything, and the bank's senior leaders had to suck up to the children's parents. And then there was a young man from a rural area who was a good student. He tried to bring a souvenir from his hometown to the head of the department, but the wife threw it in the trash. His gift was discarded as filthy, and the young man didn't get the job by the way. Another story is about a senior government official. His son was in love with a girl from a small town with an average family background. The father stopped the relationship on the grounds that the girl's family was from a rural area and wouldn't help his son's future. For this reason, the young man and his parents shot the table and made a scene. Continuous family meetings and pressure eventually made the young man give up the girl. He eventually married another girl from the same social class as him. Years later, the son said his father's decision was right and saved him from a detour in his life. This author writes, That rural young man might make a name for himself later, but by the age of 40, his fate is already set, and it's going to take many bumps and bruises before he learns the truth about society. Chinese parents want their children to aspire to move upward, but while the transformation of the country continues, the transformation of the destiny of many individuals seems to have come to a standstill.